This one's about historical linguistics, which is the science of the history and development of languages and how we know what we know about how language used to be. Welcome and thanks for coming. My name is Daniel Midgley, and this session is part of the International Conference of Historical Linguistics, sponsored by the School of Social Sciences for the University of Western Australia, the Australian National University, and of course the Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Gunawal people and we pay respect to their elders past, present, and future. Okay, let's get started. Is everybody ready for a yeah. just, just, We'll just give it a second. Very good. We're just getting the first activity handed out and ready. Welcome. Good to see you. So while that's happening, I'll explain what's going on. You have... Um, I guess I just start off by saying that English has borrowed a lot of words from a lot of different languages. Did I say borrowed? I should say uh, we don't just borrow words. On occasion, English has pursued other languages down alleyways to beat them unconscious and ripe in their pockets for new vocabulary. And that's not my favorite quote about historical linguistics, though. My favorite is from here. English isn't a language, it's three languages stacked on top of each other wearing a trench coat. Yeah. <laughs> we certainly have borrowed a lot of words from different languages, and when we borrow words, it tends to be because of what's going on socially, historically, economically, and sometimes politically. So, what we've got for you is a sheet that looks a lot like this, and you've got to figure out these eight words. Where in the world do you think they came from? Where did English borrow them? And your clue is that this has something to do with what was going on at the time, historically, socially, etc. So you can use your knowledge of that. Now how this is going to work is you're going to get together with people near you and form a kind of a team. And then, when you think you know one of the words, it doesn't have to be all of the words, in fact I'd love to have people coming up all the time, but when you think you have a pretty good guess for any one of these words, you come up here, and uh, you will write your word on one of these clever tags and stick it in the place where you think it came from on this lovely map of the world. So, let's get started. Give you a couple minutes to grab somebody near you. It will take about three or four minutes to uh, make your best guesses as to where you think these words are, and then we're gonna have people coming up and sticking things on the map. Yes, we have chocolate. We have one chocolate over here and a chocolate over there. Is it a European chocolate or is it a South American chocolate? Central American chocolate? It's a Central American chocolate. That's right. This comes from a waffle drink. The atoll on the end, the chocolate. Uh, we don't know what exactly the form the word took, but it was something like chocolate in the atoll, which means water or something like that. It was borrowed around 1600, a time when products from Central and South America were making their way around the world. Okay, number two. I think we have one guess for taboo, and it looks like it's over here. Who had that one? Who was that? <laughs> nice! That's just about right. This is a borrowing from Tonga. First appears in the diary of Captain James Cook. And uh, if you have followed the other activities in this series, you won't be surprised to find that this Tongan word taboo appears in Maori as tapu, mm -hmm. and in Hawaiian as kapu. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's just the way those, uh, those languages roll. Number three, I'm going to guess Barak in Australia. Could that be? I, I thought it would be Aboriginal. You are absolutely correct. What? Oh, I just thought it back. This is one of those that you wouldn't expect. So this one comes from the Wakamura language of Victoria. It starts appearing in books around 1934. Wow. So the story is that it wasn't Barak, it was Borak originally. And if you were talking Borak, you were talking nonsense. And if you were poking Borak at someone, you were giving them abuse. But eventually the word changed so that if you were poking Borak at someone, or if you were barracking at someone, you were shouting at them, but not to abuse them, but to give them encouragement. But in Britain, to barrack someone is still means to give them abuse, not to support them at all. Does it really? Okay. This borrowing was borrowed, but the meaning didn't change uniformly all over the place. That is interesting. Okay, we're going on. I didn't see any guesses for, oh no, we have one guess for Verana, right about here. 
or was it really India? Borrowed in Hindi around 1711, there was a lot of words from the British occupation in India that made their way into English. Now let's see, Pika, controversial choice but mostly centered around here, was that about right? Yes, many languages have a word like pita to refer to some kind of bread. This one, we're not sure exactly where it comes from. It could be Greek pita or Hebrew pita. But it first appears in English in 1951. Is pizza related to pita? Ah, oh, that is a really good question. I don't know the answer. Not <laughs> I'm pretty sure so, he is. Like, a, like is it, could it be a diminutive? That's what no, I'm saying. Hmm. I'll check that one on my phone while other things are going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, awesome. Let's see. Typhoon. Uh, I see one over here, sort of uh, around China. And that is a pretty good guess, but secretly, Greek again. Ooh. Surprising. There was a, a god Typhoon in, in the mid 1500s. This was starting to become. A little bit more of the word that was used, but uh, that's not Greece. Is that meant to be on Cyprus? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the other, the other numbers. Now, a few people thought that this might have been a Cantonese thing or a Chinese thing. It kind of was. There is a Chinese term, Dai Feng, big wind, and that does exist, and that probably influenced the way the word looks. But it wasn't the original. Sometimes words can have more than one motivator. Okay, monsoon. Well, a lot of people think this one is kind of an Indian thing. It's older than that. The word monsoon comes from Arabic mosim, which meant it didn't have anything to do with the storm at first. It just meant the time of the year. The time of the year to do something, like to go on a trip or something like that. But eventually the meaning spread to mean the time of the year when the big storms come, and that's when it got borrowed as monsoon. And no surprises for emoji. Japanese. Yes. Surprisingly unrelated to emoticon. Emoji and emoticon aren't related. An emoticon is an emotional icon, but an emoji comes from E, electronic, and emoji meaning character. So, lots of words going on here. Embedded within each language is the history of its speakers. We've seen how loan words are windows on the past, the European colonization of the Americas, Captain Cook's exploration of the Pacific, British colonization of India. The flow of words between languages tells us about social, political, and economic change in the history of their speakers, such as the adoption of new words and crops from particular groups at particular points in time, or the exchange of ideas, such as the introduction of new religious traditions. But love words are only one way in which language reflects history. We can find out much about the past from studying the continuity of languages over time as they are transmitted from one generation to the next. This allows us to look at the ancestry and origins of both languages and their speakers. For example, some words and grammatical structures in modern English have been retained from Old English and, even earlier, from ancestral languages, Proto-Germanic, which is why such features are also shared by German, a sister language of English. To study continuity and change, we can use written records, but for most of the world's languages, they don't exist. So, linguists compare today's spoken languages to reconstruct history. Let's take a look at how this is done. I'd be very pleased to hear from Mary Walworth from the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. reconstructing the history of Pacific Islands through language. And so what I do is look at how languages spoken today give us clues about how people in the past were related to each other and how they were interacting with each other. So modern day languages contain remnants of sounds, words, and structures that have evolved over time that historical linguists like myself used to reconstruct language histories and the histories of the people who speak these languages today. So, like an archaeologist digs in the ground to find evidence of the past, historical linguists sort of dig through languages 
uh, to find similarities and differences that help us trace the roots of the speakers of these languages. Instead of objects, like Indy here, we have sounds and words, and we write them down and we record them. And instead of digging for skeletons or stone tools or pottery, we record. So let's look at some examples from oceanic languages, the languages that are spoken in the Pacific, uh, in the islands of the Pacific. Let's look first at the number five. Um, across many languages here in the Pacific, something very similar emerges, as you can see. Uh, in Tahitian, uh, right in the middle of this light blue area, and in Maori at the end here, in the southern part of the light blue area, we have rima. Yeah. I already knew five was rima in Maori. That's great. That's good. Fantastic. Um, in Hawaiian, up north, we have lima, which is very close. Um, over here in Fiji, we also have lima. In Micronesia, this area that's sort of purple, we have some languages that uh, represent five as lima and some as nima. Um, over here in New Britain, in the yellow area there, we have lima again. Um, and in North Vanuatu, in this orange space, the first one, line, very similar, not quite the same. And then uh, down in New Caledonia, again in the southern part of that orange area, is nim. So these similarities allow us to trace a common ancestor between these languages, a sort of a great-great-grandmother language, which we call proto-language. And here it's uh, proto-oceanic. And based on the forms of these similar words, uh, and what we know about the different sound structures of these languages today, uh, we can hypothesize what might have been the word in the proto-language. So in this case, we have proto-oceanic. We can hypothesize that it was Lima. Now, changes from the proto-language that are shared by certain languages allow us to group these certain languages more closely together. So here, for woman, linguists have reconstructed papine for proto-oceanic. But if you look at all of the common words for woman throughout the Pacific, it's easy to see that they relate to this word, sort of see some strong similarities even just by looking without knowing anything about the sound systems of these languages. Um, we have vavine in the languages of North and South Vanuatu, there again in the orange. We have faifine in the languages of Mi Micronesia up there in the purple. Uh, in this area, which is supposed to be a little bit further, the line supposed to be a little bit further into Samoa, we have fafine in Western Polynesia. And then in the rest of the Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, in East Polynesia, we have Vahine. So these differences in the development of the sounds allow us to separate some of these languages into groups that are more closely related than to the others. So you could say that all of the languages showing something like Papine in the Pacific um, are very clearly descendants of Proto-Oceanic, and that they're related but that the languages of Eastern Polynesia are more like sisters, and that the East languages of East Polynesia to the languages of, let's say, the area in orange, they're more like distant cousins. Even though they're all related, we've got sister languages and sort of cousin languages further away. So from these words and sounds that help us group together languages and reconstruct these great-grandmother languages, or proto-languages as we call them, we can then hypothesize where languages might have originated from, and from that, where the ancestors of the people who speak these languages might have come from and migrated from in the deep, deep past. We can also kind of tell who they stayed in contact with in the process of their migrations. With other historical scientists, the sciences, like archaeology and genetics, we can even put dates on those movements, and we can find out what kind of people were speaking these languages as well. And that lets us sort of create a big, whole, complete picture and snapshot of the past. So here in this map, uh, we can see that speakers of languages in the Western and Central Pacific came there about 3,000 years ago, and we know that based on the archaeological record, and that speakers of languages in the Eastern Pacific came there about 1,000 years ago. So that's what we can do to reconstruct the past. Thanks. Please hear from Henry Wu.
AAU, an honor student here at AAU. Hi, so I'm an undergraduate student at the ANU, and I'm going to talk about something really old today. Um, so this is the oldest datable printed book in the world. It was found in a cave in Dunhuang, here in western China, and it's a sutra, a kind of a Buddhist sacred text, and it has the name the Diamond Cutter, because its teaching is said to be able to cut through illusions to see the world for what it really is. We know when it was made because at the end of the text, it gives us a precise date. It says, made on the 15th day of the fourth month of the ninth year of the reign period of Shenkong. Converting that to the current Western calendar, we get the 11th of May, 868 AD. So it's the ninth century. It's also in Chinese, which means it was meant for a Chinese audience, which is not always a given when we're looking at texts over here in Western China. So this is a really remarkable object in its own right, you know, the oldest stable printed book in the world. But what interests me more is the bigger picture, because Buddhism isn't native to the area which this text was found. In fact, Buddhism was born on the other side of the Himalayas, so that white bridge there, in the north of India. The actual text here was probably composed many centuries before it ever became popular in China in a completely different language. So my big question is this. How does something as complex as religion move from one culture to another? How do we get to the stage where people who have never been to India in their lives are writing about things that the Buddha had to say? Um, and what kinds of people and actions are needed in this process of transferal? So returning to this book, what kinds of things can an object like this tell us about this process? While an archaeologist might focus on the materials that were used, or a religious studies scholar might look at the ideas in the text and how it differs from uh, the ideas in similar texts, the linguist object of study is the language. So what does the writing itself, its style, its grammar, its composition, tell us about that process, about how these texts were made and spread, and that bigger picture of how religion moves from one culture to another? I said at the beginning that this text is in Chinese, down the side here, but that's only half of the story. Because texts like these were translated from other languages, unlike texts produced in China at the time in Chinese. We also know in some cases who these translators were. Uh, some of them are named at the beginning of texts and in collections about the lives of the monks who were doing this translation. For instance, Kumarajiva, who translated this text at the beginning of the 5th century, uh, so centuries, four and a half centuries before this text was actually produced. Translation turns out to be a really important part of global history. It's through translation that words and ideas can spread across uh, cultural boundaries between speakers of different languages. If the linguist object of study is language then, then historical linguistics seems to be the perfect candidate to understand this process of cultural transformation. So my question here is this, how can we better understand how this translation process took place by looking at the actual language of these translated texts? So what I've been doing is applying language, uh, models of language change uh, that linguists have already come up with studying living and dead languages uh, and seeing if we can apply them to this specific context to see you know, how we can reconstruct this picture of transmission. And a lot of that work is focused on the idea of language contact which is what happens when more than one language is being used in a community and languages change as a result. So linguists have recognised for a long time now that this process has a lot to do with bilingual speakers or multilingual speakers who switch between one language and another, affecting how they use both. And these translators who transmitted texts just like this one must have also been multilingual in some sense of the term. Linguists have said exactly how these changes happen have a lot to do with the social context that these multilingual speakers use their languages in. For example, whether you use one language a lot more than another language affects how your language use changes. 
So if we have some theories about how bilinguals change the languages that they speak based on how they use them, and we have some information from disciplines like history about how these translators in medieval China lived and their social setting, we can start drawing connections between the two and see what other pieces of information these models can tell us about this amazing process. For example, if we know that certain grammatical features in a text occur uh, from language A and they jump over in language B when language B is being used a lot by bilingual speakers, for instance, we can then find examples of these sorts of features in texts like this. And we can start building a picture of who these translators were more precisely, what social settings that they were working in, and those details are really crucial in understanding that bigger picture of how exactly Buddhism was transmitted from northern India to China. There's so much more I could say about these texts, and hopefully I've shown here that the application of linguistics to this case study can shed light on the details of the human past. I still think there's a lot more work to be done, and I think there's a lot more collaboration to be made between people like linguists and historians. But hopefully we've well and truly made a start in uncovering more about a really important period of history, and like a diamond cutting through illusion, we can finally see what the past was really like. Thanks. When we use historical documents to study language through time, it's important to keep in mind that much of the variation that exists in language is not captured in writing. For example, there are often different ways of saying the same thing. The music was very loud. The music was really loud. The music was so loud. The music was hell loud. <laughs> but we probably wouldn't use all of these in writing. Whenever there's more than one way of saying the same thing, there is the potential for language change. Maybe one variant will become more frequent over time, and another may be lost. Studying variation in a speech community helps us understand how change starts and spreads. And language change can, over time, give rise to language divergence. Understanding language divergence can then help us explain current patterns of language distribution. Have you ever wondered why, in certain parts of the world, many languages are spoken, whereas in others, there may be only a single widespread language? Let's find out more. I'm be pleased to hear from uh, Dr. Celeste rodriguez Mar. Do your parents or teachers ever complain about young people staring at their smartphones all the time? <laughs> I know. My parents and teachers complain about that too. Now, let's uh, imagine that three friends are texting each other on their smartphones. Let's call these three friends time, language, and linguist. Time, language, and linguist. So time is like, there's no going back. And language is like, huh, I am bloody hard to catch. So linguist is like, lol, you two, don't panic. I have an idea. Real and apparent time. So what's this conversation about? Well, to begin with, there's no going back into the past. That's simply a fact. Secondly, when language is spoken, the actual sound bites are ephemeral. They are difficult to catch. Unless you secretly record every single conversation you have, which would be entirely unethical, and very, very weird. So how does linguist study the way language was used in the past? How does linguist study variation and the way in which variation may sometimes lead to change? Well, linguist has two main ways to do this. And these two ways are crazy popular in the field of language variation and change. The two ways are known as real and apparent time. And they are very useful when the time depth is shallow. So we're really talking 200 years or so. Real time is about 
studying language within a single speech community at different points in time. So let me tell you a story. A few years ago, I was really keen to know how speakers of what we may call mainstream Australian English were doing storytelling. I wasn't able to travel back in time, obviously, but I did get in touch with folk at the State Library of Western Australia who told me about uh, their oral history collection. I then did some research on their collection, and this was a real-time study because the actual oral histories were collected at different points in the past. In, for example, 1952, 1986, 2001, I'm guessing, way before most of you were even born. Now, apparent time refers to the apparent passage of time. So what you do is you compare speakers of different ages in a single speech community, and for it to be apparent time, you need to do it at a single point in time. For example, if we suddenly decided to head out into the field interview um, speakers aged 20, 40, 60 years old, we would have a very good group of speakers for this kind of study. We would be able to compare how different generations use language at a single point in time. And what you're really comparing is what language was like when these people were acquiring it. So for someone aged 60 in 2019, they were acquiring language in the 1960s. And we can assume that their sound system and their grammar, the more structural aspects of their language, will reflect what was happening to, say, Canberra English in the 1960s. An interesting thing about the apparent time method is what it assumes, which is that People don't really change the way they speak after puberty, especially uh, if you focus on, on uh, um, phonological, so the basic phonology and grammar. But let's return to old people or older people complaining about stuff. We said at the very beginning that old people are likely to complain about young people staring at their smartphones all the time. You know what else older people complain about? Older people have always complained about language changing. When I was young, English was spoken perfectly, not like young people today. <laughs> Linguist William Lebov calls this the golden age principle, the belief that in the past, language existed in a state of perfection. <laughs> Truth is, however, language has never been perfect in the sense that it's never been invariable. Language is full of complexity, and complexity is what makes language wicked and fun and fascinating. Thank you. We now invite the stage Professor Nick Evans, Director of the Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. Thank you. Um, Okay, you saw this slide already. Uh, it comes as a surprise to many people. There's 7,000 languages in the world, but they're not distributed at all evenly. And this, is, this maps the gross linguistic product of, uh, of countries scale to the number of languages that are endemic to them. Biggest country in the world on this measure is Papua New Guinea, just to our north. Of the world's 7,000 languages, it has about 800. So this is about more than 10% of the world's languages in that, in 1% of the land surface, but it looks bigger here. And then just west of that is Indonesia, which is number two. And you can see that our part of the world is actually a huge, um, part of the world's linguistic diversity. So the question is, why? How did, how did that happen? Let's look at New Guinea in a bit more detail first. There it is, like a big bird with the head to the northwest and the tail to the southeast and a fat belly nearly touching Cape York. And 
on that one continent, sorry, that one island, not only are there about 1,000 languages, but they group into about 80 families or isolates, which is a language like Basque you can't relate to any others. And there's about as much linguistic diversity on that 1% of the world's land surface island than there is in the whole of Eurasia, from Japan to Ireland, and from northern Siberia to Sri Lanka. How can we understand something like that? And surprisingly, there's much more diversity in New Guinea than there is in Africa, even though that's the home of humankind and would be expected to have had more time to communicate diversity, to accumulate diversity, just as it has, has more genetic diversity. Now, when you talk to someone on the street about this, almost everyone thinks they know the answer. They think, oh yeah, people are up there on isolated mountain tops and they never talk to each other and you know, the languages gradually drift apart. Just as in uh, Polynesia, you heard Mary talking before, and people think, yeah, they go out on different islands and they stop communicating and their languages just drift apart. But when you look at what happens, here uh, to the uh, left is the topography of the highlands with its scary, uh, root, uh, scary bridges thrown across deep chasms. It really is hard getting around. Uh, there's some more of it. And here in the north is the flatlands in the south where going from one village to another, going across a language border like the one between English and Indonesian, say, is like walking from here to the O'Connor shops. And in this little group of, of guys here with their, their bikes, that's the main highway, uh, are speakers both of Nen and of Idi, two local languages. Uh, in fact, all of them know both. So it's not the case that it's isolation producing diversification. Rather, it's contact, as we, as we heard about from Henry, uh, contact can produce all sorts of interesting effects. Let's look at some of them. One that you probably think about often is that it can produce pigeons and creoles. Pigeons happen when people are just striving to bridge the communication gap with no common starting point, both sides simplifying their language and ending up with something uh, that's a sort of boiled down, stripped down language. Uh, but things can go the other way. You can get complexification as lots of, of memes or ideas from two or more languages get pulled in together. If we think about names for musical forms, in English we've got song, but we've also got chanson, we've got lit, we've got a, a lot of other uh, names for different song types uh, if you, you know, study different types of music. Uh, but in French, chanson is just a, a song. If you, if you say in English, it's probably something like you might associate with Edith Piaf or, or someone. Uh, and likewise, lit you might associate with the music of, of Schubert, but in German it just means song. Going the other way, the English word song has entered German, but it means a rock song, not just any old song. So as we bring in words from other languages, we're enriching our semantic palette. We, we can paint the world with a wider range of colours thanks to uh, these extra words we're borrowing in. And that doesn't happen just in the world realm of words, it happens in the realm of sounds, in the world of, world, realm of grammatical structures, and so on. So we can do some pretty nifty things in linguistics, uh, and one thing we can do is just to look at basic words, like I and you and he and she and him and his and so on, and see what goes together. And if you ever subject yourself to the agony of learning another language and making mistakes, you know that these don't always line up. So uh, when, as an English speaker, I uh, go to speak Nen, which is a Papuan language uh, in a part of Southern New Guinea where I work, and I might say, he saw him in English and happily uh, speak Italian and just reproduce the same structure, Louis Lovide, uh, in the past tense, he spoke Louis Parlot, 
you can see that just as he is the same in those two cases, and Louis in Italian is the same in those two cases, but in Nen, I have to split them up. Uh, so, Yaman is he doing something to someone else, what linguists call it ergative or a, and ba is he just acting without regard to someone else. And even worse, the ba in he spoke is the same as the him in he saw him. So you cut the world up in a very different way. And that's what I've shown there with the colours. And these uh, little graphs here compare Latin and Italian at the top, and you can see without going into the details that they haven't changed much. And here at the bottom, Nen and Idi, which were the languages spoken by those guys with the bike. You can see instantly how different they are. Even though, not just are these villages only 10 kilometres apart, but actually the languages are spoken one centimetre apart in a marital bed because people uh, marry each other across the languages and use the languages day by day in the same household. So even though that's happening, the languages are stubbornly uh, retaining their structure and when we look uh, more closely, you can see that um, they're actually you know, borrowing interesting structures and each one is becoming more complex thanks to input from the others. And here we've got a, another uh, type of graph that we call a neighbour net, which you can use to measure the structural distance between things. Here, the structural difference between those nice paradigm pictures I put up before. And you can see the little purple ones down the bottom left uh, represent Nen and its, uh, its mates, the other uh, sister languages of it. And up there in the top right, the green ones are uh, Idi and its uh, brother and sister languages, and then lots of other languages. You can see that despite being so close, they're very, very different in terms of their structure. Another thing that can happen when languages come into contact is that you can actually produce a new language. Sometimes these are called mixed languages. And what happens here is you build up structure, taking some from one, some from the other. Now you need to have a very special uh, set of circumstances for this to happen. Basically, you've got to have a couple of languages spoken and people in an emerging generation who hear their parents and others moving back and forth between two languages, what's sometimes called code switching, grab bits and pieces out of the two and forge a new language which has elements of both. As if to say, it's not just that I'm Australian or Chinese, but I'm Australian Chinese, and I'm proud of both elements of my identity, and here they both are. So this is a language called Gurindji Creole, uh, studied by Felicity Meekins, and we heard her talking about uh, this language this morning in, in our conference. And Gurindji is a traditional Aboriginal language that's shown in orange, all the elements of words and grammatical elements coming from that. And Creole is a sort of pidgin ultimately coming from English, but with some changes. So like, then it being gone from then it being gone or something, with a lot of change over 100, 100, 150 years. So the crucial thing here is if someone says, a fish jabbed her in the, ha in the hand, and, and you say, Yaungo ibn torpi waran, uh, you can hear some words like im and uh, in ibin, which come from English, and others like yawangul, which doesn't only have a word fish from Gurindji, but even has a suffix ngu, just like in Nian saying this is what does, uh, this is something that does something to someone else. Uh, so that's a structure that's a very non English like structure, but has carried through into. Gurindji Creole. So this is a, a very special uh, type of outcome of language contact and it's one of the things that gives rise to new languages. So I will uh, leave uh, this very interesting issue here but just emphasise in, in doing so that all of this comes from actually getting out there in the dirt, in villages, in communities, sitting in the shade of a tree, talking to people and recording them that's where the information is, where we need to understand these things. 
Uh, it's a lot of fun doing it. You get to meet some incredible people and crack some uh, wonderful puzzles in doing that. And I hope that some of you will want to join linguistics and hear the world at some point in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our speakers for some amazing insights. We'd now like to invite all of our speakers back up onto the stage. This is a chance that you have. Maybe you have been working through the activities on the website with your class. Maybe you've had some uh, thoughts firing your brain. Now's a good time for questions. So if anybody has any, we will have someone bring the microphone around to you. Let's see. Louise will be our microphone bringer. If you have any, go ahead and just put your hand up and you can ask the panel. I've got some questions myself, but who's got one to start off with? Um, no offense. Wait until the uh, <laughs> mic comes to you. Very good. No offense, but are you Canadian? <laughs> Me? Yeah. <laughs> On this July 4th, I am going to pretend that I am Canadian. <laughs> well, let's have another question, but this time about linguistics. We got. It. While we're waiting for that to come around, I've, I've got one that I'm really curious about, and that is that we've talked a lot about language change and the language diversity. But why do languages change? Why don't we just speak one way and then just everybody just keeps doing that one thing? <coughs> Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is identity. Uh, language is very much connected to a sense of self and not just as an individual, but as a community. And uh, so I think that's quite powerful. And so when you hear people say, why don't we just all learn the one language, whatever that might be, then that's problematic because then you're really dealing with people's identity and sense of self. So that's one way you can answer that bit. Yeah. So uh, a linguist called Joe Greenberg once said that uh, speakers of languages are like lousy car mechanics and no language is perfect. And as they try and fix up part of one part of the language, they bugger up another part. Uh, and that's another part of the, of the answer. Because in having a language, we're trying to solve multiple problems at the same time. And we can give a simple illustration of this with two dimensions of a problem we face with pronouncing a word. So one thing we want to do is make it easy for our articulators, our tongue and our teeth and so on, to make the sounds to pronounce the word. And that means smoothing sounds into each other. But we also want to have constant mental targets of uh, what, word, what sound sequence goes with a meaning. So let's just take the negative. Now in English, we can have uh, Germanic negatives like un, like untruthful, or um, unbelievable. And there the N just stays as an N. We're not saying unbelievable, we're saying unbelievable, so we hold to it. On the other hand, if you take the Latinate in, which also has the French ones, you, you might say uh, indisputable, but immoral with the M. So you're resolving it in favour of ease of articulation. And if you go out to look at uh, Italian or Latin, they always resolved it in favour of ease of articulation. Uh, German always resolves it in favour of what linguists call faithfulness. You just keep to the form of the word and you don't change it. Right? Uh, and English is an interesting mix depending on where the words come from. But it's that tension between rival solutions. None of them works all the time that jiggers languages so that there's different forms floating around and then for these identity purposes, people seize on one form or another to say, hey, I'm someone who does this, I belong to this group. So that's one of the reasons why language is challenging. Yeah. Sure, I'll also comment on that. 
definitely has to do with identity, but also when languages come into contact in the past and in the recent past, you've got, you know, maybe two very different languages coming together in one family, and mom speaks one thing and dad speaks another, and then the child growing up in the house might speak both languages or a combination of those languages. And as a result, you might, a few generations later, end up with a completely different language that's a merger of the features of, of both of those other languages. So you end up with a little bit of language change in that way as well. Yeah. And I mean, completely related to this point, you know, language as this cultural tool, as we develop the need to make a reference to new things, we obviously have to come up with new ways to describe, new ways to handle these cultural uh, interactions between people. And I think that's how, I mean, if you compare how people spoke a thousand years ago and how people spoke now, yes, a lot of grammar and stuff has changed, but also a lot of the things that, to do with how we actually interact with people, uh, you know, different words, uh, to refer to different relationships, different words for things we've invented. Um, so, you know, it is a very uh, power, language is a very powerful tool uh, to describe these things and to interact with people in that way. Uh, basically, you mentioned that the Papua New Guinea had a thousand languages and then now maybe 800 is still there. I just want to know, over a period of the last 200 years, it did the languages of languages now yeah. to reduce or they increase? Or they, do they have a script for all these languages? Yeah. Or have them? No, uh, that, I use two different words, but they probably flew past because I was talking too quickly. But uh, when I said Papua New Guinea, I was referring to the modern nation state, which occupies the eastern half of the island of New Guinea, whose western half is part of Indonesia politically. So the, the larger figure of a thousand is for the whole island of New Guinea, uh, and the smaller figure is for the country of Papua New Guinea. So, so Papua New Guinea is losing some languages, but not, not many and not fast. Can you pass it down for us and then come back? Do we know how languages are created and changed and who by, like the youth or the elders of people? So who, who changes? So you're asking who drives change forward? Yeah, that's a very good question actually. Um, so this is changing all the time, but the the most strongly supported position is that it's young women, at least at the very beginning of change, when it's taking off. And for some changes, including the use of like, which I'm sure some of you use like all the time and some of you complain about. <laughs> um, so for that particular change, for instance, you see that males tend to take a little bit longer to catch up with the women. But that's for this particular change uh, that I'm thinking about, and also for white Australia. It doesn't really apply to other varieties of English, including Aboriginal English, that I'm doing research on at the moment. So, you know, just, but it's generally young women. So I, I think that what Celeste has said reflects the fact that a lot of the detailed studies of language change have come from urban, mainstream Western societies, and that work we're doing in Papua New Guinea and elsewhere at the moment, and Vanuatu also, is suggesting that's not always young women. Uh, it's sometimes even old guys uh, who've <laughs> accumulated a lot of lang languages in their lifetime, and then you have young guys hanging out with the old guys in, say, in Nakamal, in Vanuatu, and wanting to sound like them, and the middle-aged men and the women aren't sounding like them. So uh, it's, it illustrates the thing that not only do languages differ a lot from society to society, but it's possible that the processes of change and where the action is in terms of language change is different from society to society. But probably what's true in all of these cases is it's not committees, it's not official bodies, uh, things like the Alliance Francaise or you know parents or teachers or whoever who are driving the change. It's coming from below, like a swell, 
and uh, there's very little anyone can do to, to regulate it. You, 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 it's like having very bad brakes on a very fast car. You know, sometimes <laughs> it has a little effect, but not very much. Just on that, I think, I think you're right, Nick, but also I think that it's, it is the young people who eventually, even if the change yeah, yeah, comes yeah. from, yeah. it is the young people who eventually make the language change, so. Well, just experiment yeah. and try to do some language change. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, from a contact perspective, so this is when uh, you have multiple languages being spoken in the community, a lot of the time it's bilingual and multilingual speakers who introduce a lot of changes by, uh, you know, having one feature being brought into uh, the language uh, and having change happen that way. And I think it's really important to remember that language change, uh, when we talk about language contact, so when two languages come together, it's the speakers of those languages, and specifically uh, bilingual speakers, often young speakers, but bilingual speakers generally, who have it in their brains, have the language in their brains, and that's how uh, language ultimately changes from the individual, and then it builds up to the societal level. We are going to need to leave it there. It is possible, if you have time, to come down and ask questions to our panel. But uh, for now, let's thank our speakers. Mm -hmm.